And as a running start, I want to remind us where we are. Uh, in the previous lecture, you should have been introduced to Charles Darwin, the concept of evolution, the historical backdrop, the controversy surrounding it, and the final state of the theory of evolution. Now, the second half of lecture six, we're gonna talk about individual differences. And the concept of studying individual differences actually is a, a long history. So Juan Huerte uh, wrote a book called The Examination of Talented Individuals. And as early as the 1500s, you could see there was an interest in trying to understand the unique qualities of the individual, not just the norms and where the average person is, but where an individual is relative to their peers. And he suggested that children's programs should include individualized uh, learning. Uh, a Montessori approach would probably be a very good example of individualized learning. Uh, and, you know, recognizing these differences are important to facilitate the growth of each child. So, but that brings us to Galton. Some 300 years later, uh, Francis Galton, or Sir Francis Galton, he was also knighted. Uh, he was one of the people who brought the discussion of individual differences back to the table. Because while people like Weber and Fechner and Helmholtz, um, they mentioned individual differences, for example, differences related to uh, two-point thresholds and things of that nature, there was some acknowledgement of individual differences, but there was more of a focus on the norm or the group average. So prior to Galton, there was this, um, I guess it was viewed as more inappropriate for the field of psychology to study the uniqueness of the individual. Now, Galton himself, you may recall from the previous lesson, he is uh, Charles Darwin's cousin. They share a uh, grandparent in Erasmus Darwin. Galton was considered exceedingly intelligent. His estimated IQ was roughly 200. And he had um, diverse talents and knowledge to the point where, you know, he could pick locks. He understood uh, periscopes. He created a periscope. Uh, etc. He did a lot. And um, he was the youngest of nine children in his family. Um, and his family was of a high social status. Now that is important because when you think about the concept of eugenics and the belief that certain people should marry with others and certain people should not, this is going to come back. So he was pressured to do medicine. Uh, he didn't like it. So he switched over to mathematics uh, at Cambridge University. Uh, he loved traveling. So he wrote a book called The Art of Travel and uh, received you know, commendations for that from the Royal Geographic Society. Uh, and we talked about Charles Darwin. So I'm not going to repeat that. He wrote a book called Heredity Genius, in which he believed, quote, eminent men have eminent sons. Now, it's very important, this phrase, because the suggestion is that eminence come from males. Where do females get their eminence from? Through marriage, right? So the suggestion was that females uh, adopt the status of their partner. And uh, that's, that's how they get their eminence. But in terms of one's ability, 
that is inherited. So genetics, according to Galton, was 100% of the reason why you are who you are and the abilities that you possess. Today, we know that's not true, but that was his belief. So he felt that people of stature should marry people of stature. And if you uh, watch shows like Bridgerton, that's kind of the, the subtext about this person of this family of uh, aristocracy is going to be set up or have dates with another family of aristocracy because it was that time period where they felt that people needed to be uh, with their kind in quotes, right? Uh, so marrying down was viewed very negatively. And uh, certainly when it came to Galton, he did not want his children to marry outside of their status. So what are examples of, uh, of this? You know, he suggested that genius is inherited. So a great scientist might come from a line of scientists. And it's quite interesting because um, they do come from a line of scientists. Galton himself, uh, if you look at it, his cousins, Darwin, and his grandfather's Erasmus Darwin. So he used his own experience as the prototype of how genius is inherited, right? So uh, he also studied some of his colleagues right, and contemporaries and how they had really uh, solidified uh, statuses. Can you tell me what the flaw in this logic is? What's the problem with heredity genius? The fact that he studied his contemporaries who came from status and he looked at his own lineage and they came from status and drew the conclusion that you have to come from status. What's the problem? Laura. Obviously, he's a scholar and the people around him are going to be scholars, too. So studying them is just um, biased because they're clearly going to have some sort of uh, like intelligence. Right. So on one angle, we have this issue that, sure, you, you're, you come from a status, you're going to associate with other people of status. So that is going to be passed on but I'm looking for something different. Does anyone have another thought on this? Jenny. Uh, the particip participant for his study is like too small, I guess. Yeah, so it's a very small uh, select group. That's true. Um, I, Gabrielle, can you tell me what um, you mean by environment? you just consider eugenics and the, the like the genetics that you're getting it from the biology of your parents and passing it from aristocrat to aristocrat so on and so on you're not taking into consideration the surrounding areas and how the brain is um, reacting or learning from the surroundings around you so let's say you know you get two kids one's poor one's rich it doesn't matter if the poor one can read the books because that doesn't matter he didn't come from the the rich smart people aristocrats so he's not going to have what they have be as smart well i'm going to say you're partially correct what i'm going to say is that people who were poor there was no way of breaking from one stratosphere to the next it was uh, people who are poor wound up working on farms and it doomed the next generation to be poor and then the next generation to be poor until we start the industrial revolution and that creates a movement for jobs in a city and upward mobility. So in the 1800s and even with the industrial revolution, it's called the Gilded Age because it's the illusion of upward mobility for most. Right. So that was a time period where 
if you didn't have money, you are probably not going to be going to school uh, to high levels. You are working the farm and you couldn't just go against that for the most part. You were, that was your life. That was your, your lot in life. But we see today when people are given more of a chance to break from the stratosphere that they come from, they show you that this is not true, right? So uh, if it was 100% of your mental ability was due to genetics, then why is it that later in history, people who would have been viewed as lacking eminence came to such high status? It is the environment to some degree, but the environment was so closed that it didn't create space for breaking through the stratosphere. Does that make sense? I hope. Yeah. Okay, good. So, so really that's the logic. So we have a couple pieces here. One, he cherry picked his participants right? So when you cherry pick your participants, that is a bad sample to begin with. And two, the environment was so sealed off that it was very hard to break your, your status in life, you know, and think about, I, I keep thinking about Bridgerton because this is roughly the time period. Uh, and when you think about Bridgerton, remember the, the young man who works for the printing press and there's a scandal as one of the um, elite, the aristocrat uh, girls is hanging out with someone of such a low class. Think about the message that was sent. You, there's such a separation that there's no space for growth, no space for transcending it. So the logic is certainly bad. All right, but as an outgrowth of this belief that your mental ability was determined by genetics, there was a movement call, called the eugenics movement, which felt that they had the right to either sterilize or block people from procreating if they did not possess the appropriate genes. So if a person had an intellectual disability, it was not uncommon for them to be sterilized. And that's even in the United States. And so you would, you know, uh, have an intelligence test. You would see how people are performing. And uh, then you would be recommended to either marry, not marry, have kids, not, not have kids, et cetera. But the idea of eugenics, he wanted his kids and he offered incentives uh, to marry someone who was gifted, right? Someone who had some status in life. And the, the belief was that this eminence was not a function of opportunity. Entirely incorrect, but was a prevailing attitude in the 1800s. Now, look at this graphic. And this is all the way up to 1935. And if you were to look at the laws that allowed for sterilization of a person with uh, an intellectual disability, what we used to call mental retardation, right? Uh, or some other uh, birth defect, look at how many states had laws in effect. Now, um, if you look at the striped, these are laws that were remained in effect um, in all of those states. If you look at the solid black, those were states in 1935 who had bills proposing eugenics, right? So, and then the stars are the states that subsequently uh, repealed it, right? So, places like Nevada. But if you see this map, you're looking at maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, roughly 10 states uh, 
that had this, right? The 10 states had no law. So almost four out of uh, every five states, I say almost because you see this is Hawaii's not here yet and whatnot because of the time in history, but almost 80% of the country allowed sterilization. Now, 1935, think about what's happening in Germany. What's happening in Germany at this point in history? Anyone have a sense of that? Um, the Nazis. The Nazis are growing in power, right? So in 1932 and 1933, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis uh, win the majority of the election and ultimately he becomes chancellor and fills his cabinet with Nazis, right? And by 1935, they have complete control over the government and they're starting to create race laws about uh, the Aryan race being a superior race. And then, you know, the potential for extermination of those people who were inferior. So think about those race and hygiene laws in Germany and look at what's happening in the United States. I know we would like to criticize the Nazis and they deserve a lot of criticism, but our country wasn't too far off when you think about it. We believed, now we didn't believe in mass extermination, but we believed in stopping from passing that genetic uh, characteristic on. And we didn't know enough about genetics to determine in an objective way, what is considered a desirable characteristic versus an undesirable characteristic. So there are a lot of people who very well could have been sterilized inappropriately in the United States. So that is the zeitgeist. That's what's happening. So it wasn't just Germany who felt that we should restrict um, procreation for people who have uh, undesirable character traits. Uh, that's one thing. Now, I will also say there's a psychologist at this time by the name of Henry Garrett. <laughs> and Henry Garrett is a psychologist who's growing in prominence in the 1930s. And he ultimately becomes the president of the American Psychological Association and New York State Psychological Association and was a very big proponent of eugenics, similar to Galton. And he used this argument of keeping people separate, separate but equal for genetics. And he felt that it would be better if we keep each race or ethnic group separate from one another to prevent mixing of the races and contaminating the gene pool. He said this as part of his testimony on Brown versus Board of Ed. So as there are these great psychologists uh, testifying, Kenneth and Mammy Clark, why we should integrate schools, you have Garrett on the other side testifying why we shouldn't integrate the schools and why integration or mixing of the races was a problem. So there is a lot as it relates to history that we don't talk about. Now, how many of you knew about how widespread uh, sterilization was in the United States all the way up into the 1930s? So Gabrielle, you had a sense of this. Um, how many of you is this new? Like you never heard this before. I'm actually learning about it in my other class, my other psychology class. Right, so Jenny and Victoria and Chloe. So first of all, that makes me feel good that I'm having a dialogue 
about psychology uh, that you haven't heard before, because that means I'm breaking new ground. A lot of the things in the history of psychology, you'll, you'll know the names, but this is a big one. And I feel like I've kind of overemphasized the point, but it goes back to Galton. Galton believed in this idea of eugenics and from the 1800s all the way into the mid 1900s, this had profound effects, not just on sterilization, but on education and marriage and using the same bathrooms and using the same water fountains. So there's a, a lot to be said here. This now, is about sterilization um, for, uh, so they couldn't reproduce like any type of like. Yeah, Things so like this that, right? is the right. eugenical sterilization is what this slide is talking about. Okay. But there was an application of the logic of eugenics to keep the races separate. To keep, oh. Right? And people like Henry Garrett took this logic to fight against integration of the schools. And other people took this to fight against um, mixed or uh, mixed race marriages. So, you know, when we talk about what seems so foreign to us today, it was pretty prominent, pretty prominent. Even in New York, look at New York um, with that nice stripe, right? 1935, as of January 1, had laws on the books, right? So. Uh, it's a northern state, seemingly an open-minded state, right? Progressive state. But when it came to eugenics, not so much. All right. So other things that uh, Galton wrote, he wrote uh, English Men of Science. So he kept, you know, dr drawing attention to noteworthy figures. Uh, he wrote inquiries into human faculty and its development. So that's uh, cognitive processing. He wrote natural inheritance, again, based on genetics. And so he kept pushing and pushing and pushing this concept of eugenics as far as he could. And he published 30 papers on this issue of genetic inheritance and eugenics. He creates the journal Biometrica in 1901. And um, he establishes a eugenics laboratory in London and creates an organization to promote racial improvement, what we would call racism today, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's mind boggling. Um, now, in terms of what's happening at this time period as well, we also start to see a grasp on statistics. And that's going to be helpful when we think about the bell curve, right? So people like uh, Quintalet, right, was the first person to apply statistics and the bell curve to biological and social data, right? And he talked about the quote, average man is the person in the middle. Now, again, um, most languages were gendered at this time. So man didn't just mean males, it meant mankind or humanity, as we would say. Um, so the average man was the cluster scores in the middle. Now, what's important about being able to identify the middle is we can find people who perform at the extremes as well. So if a person performs has extremely high IQ, we would call them a genius. If they're on the other side of the bell curve or extremely low IQ, we would refer to that as an intellectual disability, assuming that there were some kind of adaptive functioning deficits as well. So Galton took this concept of using statistics and he applied it to mental characteristics. So he felt that all human traits could be characterized by a mean and a standard deviation. And you could correlate or predict um, an outcome if you know one characteristic and its relationship with another, 
you could predict a given score. Now, Galton's student was named Pearson. Now, you probably have heard of Pearson based on the Pearson's R or our basic correlation, the lowercase r. That was Galton's student who came up with that, how to calculate that relationship. And Pearson's student's name was Spearman. And Spearman, you might have heard from the Spearman row, which is another statistical procedure. But what's the point? Galton is collecting large amounts of data and trying to see how an individual performs relative to their peers and looking for those individual differences. He's calculating group averages and standard deviations. And he's able to identify where you fit relative to your peers. Now, what's interesting is that Galton also originates the idea of a mental test. So Galton, now, before I get into it, I will say that Galton's version of mental test was entirely wrong. And I'll explain what I mean. <laughs> he felt that you could measure all cognitive functioning, but the way he did it was through physical or physiological means. So bodily responses. And the problem is, is that if you're using your strength or your visual acuity or your lung capacity, things like that, that isn't real intelligence, that's, you know, physical prowess. But he used this as a measure of mental test. Now, clearly he was wrong. But that concept is starting to grow. And the intelligence testing movement is also about to be created. Now, the term mental test, he didn't coin the term. He originated the concept. The person who coins the term mental test is Cattell or James McKean Cattell. And, you know, the first person to create a legitimate mental test was who created the first legitimate mental test? It's not Galton and it's not Cattell. It's a name you all know. Was it Binet? It was indeed. While Galton like, discusses the concept of measuring mental abilities, he gets it wrong. While Cattell defines what a mental test is and comes up with the terminology, he didn't create the intelligence test. It was Alfred Binet who creates the first legitimate mental test. Now, Galton believed that you could measure things like intelligence through uh, sensory uh, uh, acuteness or acuity. So how many of you would agree that if your vision is better, you're more intelligent? Is there anyone who would agree with that statement? Probably not, right? If your hearing was better, you were more intelligent. If your physical grip was better, you were more intelligent. Now, when Binet comes on the scene, he looks at the work of Galton and he's like, this is, this is not right. If my children are able to outperform me, this is clearly not measuring intelligence, right? It's obviously just measuring physical fitness or physical prowess, right? Um, but he, that's what Galton thought. So what's interesting is he created this anthropometric laboratory in Pall Mall in London. And he would have you go from test to test to test to see in the end how intelligent you were. 
So we created a whole bunch of tests, uh, testing how good your hearing was. Uh, so he blew a whistle and he wanted to test the highest frequency you could hear. Now we know that dogs have a different frequency of sound that they can hear. You might've heard the term dog whistle. So it's, it's silent to the human ear because of its frequency, but a dog can hear it, right? Uh, but people hear different frequencies uh, based on a whole host of factors, including uh, hearing loss. So that was one measure. A pendulum, he measured reaction time. Uh, a photometer, matching colors. Uh, physical strength, lifting weights, right? All of these things, none of this sounds like you're measuring intelligence, does it? No. And then the last one, which is pretty cool, is olfactory discrimination. Perfume, right? Different bottles had different perfumes and your ability to distinguish scents was um, part of his calculation of your intelligence. All right. So when we talk about his anthropometric laboratory, you know, he sets us up in Paul, Paul Mall and he has you going from test to test to test to see where your intelligence was. And you had to pay good money to get in in order to do this test. And what he hoped to do was to come up with the wide range of human capacity or mental capacity uh, for the British population. That was his goal. Now, what's interesting is that his goal to measure all of these things would never accomplish itself, right? What, the way he was doing it, it would never get accomplished because he wasn't measuring mental abilities. So coming up with a, a whole host of resources and explaining the range of British uh, mental abilities is, it's silly. Now, does that mean everything he did in this anthropometric laboratory was bad? I'll tell you, no. The answer is he did get some really good measurements on the average height, average weight, you know, those biometric measures, he got a lot of great measures, but all he got was those measure. So he could probably tell you uh, the average height of a British male in the 1880s. He could tell you that, but that has nothing to do with intelligence. He could tell you the average weight uh, for the average, the average weight of a British female right, based on all the data he uh, collected. He could tell you lung capacity and all of these things, if you're measuring them in their own or for their own sake, he could tell you a lot of important information. But if it was trying to create mental resources, he missed the boat. So his data was considered reliable, Right, so he did test, retest correlations. So if I give you the same test uh, or same test as same people at two or more points in time, how do they perform? Well, the more consistently you perform from uh, test point A and test point B, that's the more reliable it is. So it was pretty reliable. And for when it came to physical or motor developmental trends, he did give some useful information. Now, here's the deal. If we were to look uh, at the developmental rate in Galton's time, it was slower than today's estimate. Can you explain why our developmental rate might be faster than in Galton's time? Why might we develop faster than in Galton's time? Modern technology. Modern technology, what about it? 
Well, we have computers now. We have vast amount of resources. We can co- we can see data that was collected all around the world instead of just a small sample size <laughs> and have more data to compare it to. Well, I wouldn't say Britain is a small sample. It's a, if you have a thousand participants, that's already considered a pretty big sample. Well, we also have access to other psychologists and other scientists, the theories and research to compare to our own. So what I will tell you is that the general level of enrichment of society is, is more, right? It's, it's better. Remember how I talked to you about how some people would be able to go to school and they would get these high level degrees and other people who were working on farms or living in rural towns, they probably didn't get as much of an education. During the industrial revolution, many European nations and and the United States subsequently decided that it was a basic child's right to education. And they tried to create a public education system. And when you do that, you're educating the whole, whole group. So the more education, the more enrichment, the more exposure you have, you're going to perform better. And of course, his uh, data was slower because there wasn't as much enrichment in his time as there is today. And that's why when you said computers, I was kind of curious where you were going because computers are a way of accessing information and learning. Um, But in any event, our developmental trends tend to be um, faster than in Galton's time. Now, so the association of ideas, right? So he wanted to know how things were linked. So he studied a couple things or two problems, right? So he studied the diversity of association of ideas and he studied the amount of time it took to make these associations. So what would he do? He would walk down Pall Mall. Now, if you've been to London, it's this big strip, right? And he would walk, uh, focusing on any object. It could be a sign, it could be a carriage, whatever it is. And he he would walk and keep focusing on the carriage, let's say, and see what other word came to mind. And he wrote down and he was, uh, you know, blown away by the the fact that there were a whole bunch of associations that he started to make. And uh, when he repeated the test on subsequent walks, he found overlap. Now, what's interesting is that this association or this cognitive association that he was doing, he abandoned. He, he, He didn't in the end, find it useful. Uh, Cognitive psychologists might find it more useful today, whether it be uh, thought associations or whether it be word associations, we actually care about it more than he did in the end. So a word association list. He he came up with this and he was the first to uh, establish an experiment to measure associations. So if I were to, um, I don't know, put a bunch of words and ask you what comes to mind, um, you know, he would write it down and he would see what kind of linkages you made. And um, if I were to say the word ball, what comes to mind? Throw. Say it again. Throw. Throw. So you're linking uh, a verb that is appropriate for a ball, right? And then, you know, he would do this over and over and over. um, And he would see what patterns emerged. And then he started tracking the amount of time uh, it took to make these associations. And what he found was he tended to come up, if he came up with, let's say, throw, in a, on a subsequent list, he would come up with the word throw again, right? So he often gave the same response. 
And uh, he felt that this was dependent on childhood experience. And he felt that this could give us some insight into the unconscious. Doesn't this sound familiar? Sounds like a projective personality test that Freud or his followers might um, implement, right? So, so it was clearly adopted in other ways by people like Jung and Freud and whatnot. So that was the word association task. Uh, he also uh, was the first to develop what's called a psychological questionnaire, which is not just what you do or behavior. He would give you a scenario and ask you to try and create mental imagery or images of whatever the scene was. Now that's a cognitive task, isn't it, right? So you could see that this is a purely psychological questionnaire. So uh, what he did was he asked you to recall a scene and try to elicit whatever images come up. And what's interesting is that he found that imagery was also normally distributed or on a bell curve. And he found similarities between siblings. And the, those similarities were stronger than unrelated people, which further supported his idea of eugenics and how the role of heredity impacting your ability. So what were some other things he did? Now, keep in mind, this is a, a gentleman with an IQ of 200. That's our estimate. Does anyone know what the average IQ of a person is? What's the average IQ? Is it around 120, 110? 100. 100 is considered the average IQ. And a standard deviation of IQ is 15. So if we were to take a calculator, give me one second, and we were to do 100 divided by uh, 15, his IQ was considered six, almost seven standard deviations above the mean. The, his, if you were to put him relative to the the general population, his IQ was greater than 99.999%. So he was, he was clearly a genius, clearly well above the average person. But I bring this up because he did things that were pretty peculiar in terms of research that would be hard for other people to do. And you're going to see what I mean um, in a minute. One thing he did was to intentionally induce paranoia. Now, most people don't like the feeling of people spying on them or people plotting against them or whatnot. It's an uncomfortable, suspicious feeling. But what did Galton do? He wanted to do research on self-induced paranoia. So he was able to create this alternate mental state where he was suspicious of other people. And, and how did he do it? He was able to create mental imagery that every person or even everything he anthropomorphized, he saw was spying on him or a spying device. So he wanted to study that. Now, he also studied the validity of religious beliefs. So uh, he generally felt that having a belief doesn't mean that that belief is true. And, you know, in his day, he said something controversial. People believe in the power of prayer, right? Prayer is going to solve this. If you, if you can't resolve your issue, talk to God. God will handle it. And what he came to the conclusion was that prayer is actually 
useless in changing everyday life. And, you know, you could design studies where people pray and see if it changes the outcome, right? And, you know, he came to the conclusion that prayer did not change the outcome. Now, does that mean that the prayer was ineffective? People who are religious would say, just because you pray doesn't mean you're going to get what you pray. So, you know, if, if there is a God and, and God is, so to speak, your father in heaven, sometimes parents say no, right? So just because you prayed or whatever he did, it didn't happen doesn't mean it's useless. And I will tell you that his conclusion about the power of prayer is incorrect, believe it or not. Not that if you pray for a million dollars, you're going to get a million dollars, but the power of prayer and religious coping, the power of prayer and hopefulness, it affects your general quality of life. So it does affect everyday life but in a different way than he conceptualized it, right? So he uh, was interested in boredom. How do you measure boredom? He said, you know what? I'm going to measure yawns and coughs uh, at a theater. Now, can you yawn outside of boredom? Sure, right? Uh, if, it, if you need oxygen, you might yawn even if you're not bored. Uh, there are a lot of things that like he drew, he overstated his conclusion. But another thing, if I were to say, give you a math problem and I were to give you a subjective value, let's say you had five different perfumes on your, on your dresser and I were to give a numerical value for each of the perfumes. And then I would put a bunch of scents down and I would say this scent plus this scent plus this scent equals, could you, could you solve that math problem? Most people couldn't. He was able because of his, you know, ingenuity, he was able to, you know, create numerical values for smell or odors, which is uh, quite wild when you think about it. So I think that's part of his genius. Now, all right, so let's continue the discussion of animal psychology, right? Because uh, that's another piece of this and it's gonna be relevant for behaviorism. So how did animal psychology in, impact the development of functionalism? Well, before people like Darwin, they thought that animals were automata. They, they really, they were, they were machines, but they didn't really have independent, you know, thoughts and emotions. What, when Darwin wrote the expression of the emotions in man and animals, he argued that that wasn't true. He argued that your intelligence and your emotional functioning, it, there's a continuum between humans and non-human animals. And uh, he suggested that there's a very similar process for humans and non-human animals. And today we agree with, agree with this point. If you were to take uh, a neuroscience class and you would study the you know, brain functioning and intelligence of humans, of non-human primates, of um, other mammals, and then work your way down, you would see that there's a wide range of intellectual functioning and other primates, they actually have the closest intellectual functioning to us. And then as you go away from mammals to other uh, species, it becomes lower and lower and lower, right? But just because it's lower doesn't mean it's absent. So a cat and a dog has intelligence. A bird has intelligence, all right? Just like we have intelligence, it's just to a lesser degree. Now, 
Darwin wasn't the only one who believed this. Wundt argued something similar to this, right? That we refer to animals as inferior, but the only thing that makes them inferior is because they don't have the education and training that we have, right? And that's why they have lesser abilities, but they're not inherently less intelligent. At least that was his argument. Now, let's talk about Romanus. So uh, George John Romanus, he's a physiologist and he starts to study things like animal intelligence. And um, it, what's interesting is you read his description his parents thought he was not very intelligent. And um, Darwin thought otherwise. So he selected him to try and apply the theory of evolution to the mind, right? So he writes this book called Animal Intelligence, which uh, is the first comparative psychology textbook. Now, if you're interested in comparative psychology, we have a faculty member on staff uh, at the College of Staten Island called Bertrand Plug. He is very much into this. So you might have a conversation with him. And, uh, you know, animals have intelligence. And he felt that, hey, there are high levels of animal intelligence, not just that they have some, uh, to the point where he found, found similarities between the way uh, animals and humans solve problems, right? So there is this spectrum and animals have intelligence and he created a mental ladder similar to what I talked to you about where you have the lowest mental functioning animal all the way up to the highest. So you might have things like fish at the bottom and then you would um, move up the ladder to reptiles and then birds and then you'd get to mammals and then you'd get to primates and then you'd get to humans on this mental ladder showing you who has the highest intelligence but he did a very good job showing what darwin claimed that cognitive functioning or intelligence is on a spectrum and other species have it now so if you look at it, uh, he talks about this mental functioning or ladder. Here's a, a great clipping, a table from uh, your book. You'll see that, you know, when you go to different species, they have different levels of functioning. And I, it, what's interesting is jellyfish and anemones were at the bottom. Okay. So. Um, he also comes up with this concept called um, the uh, anecdotal method, right? Which the an, an anecdote is um, basically a narrative, a story that's told. Uh, and people, when they were, when they tell stories, uh, they sometimes tell fibs. And if you were to think about, and I'm going to talk about humans for the time being, how parents describe their children. Their children are always the most beautiful, intelligent, capable children in the world. They always describe them in glowing terms. But these narratives, these observational descriptions are biased, aren't they? And so these reports that Romanus is getting they're not by trained professionals. They're, there's not a, um, another person observing to look for consistency. So th this idea of an anecdotal method was uh, considered a significant flaw. Now, <clears throat> introspection by analogy is another technique of studying animal behavior that assumes that what we experience, animals experience, right? So uh, if we can know what we feel, we can understand how an animal might feel. But the problem with that is that we're giving animals human-like 
qualities and they cannot validate that, right? So we might feel we know what's on another person's mind or we might be able to infer how they're feeling, but we're gonna get it wrong pretty often if we can't ask them and have them clarify. Now, when you apply it to an animal, you're, you're gonna get what an animal is thinking and feeling wrong very often. So it's limited scientific r rigor and fact and subjective behavior, the line is not clear. Now, um, Romanus's uh, student or successor is Conway Lloyd Morgan. Now you might've heard the term Morgan's Canon. <laughs> you might have heard the term Occam's razor. And you might have heard the term law of parsimony. All three of these things suggest we adopt the principle that has the fewest amount of assumptions. And when we think about Romanus's interpretations, there are a lot of assumptions he made. So Morgan said, it's not really reasonable to assume that these animals uh, behavior is attributed to some higher level mental functioning, right? There's no reason to assume that they have the same human-like capacity. Maybe it's a lower mental functioning. And because Romanus's method was flawed, and it comes with a lot of assumptions, he couldn't adopt it. So the general principle, and you want to remember this for the test, the law of parsimony is we adopt the principle with the fewest amount of assumptions because that is most likely to be true. Now, the logic behind that is every assumption you make, you run the risk of making a mistake, an error. So the more assumptions you have, the more of that need to be substantiated. So that's the law of parsimony. Now in medicine, you'll hear it referred to as Occam's razor. Uh, uh, based on Conway Lloyd Morgan, you'll hear it referred to as Morgan's canon. And what he tried to do is he tried to create uh, a better measurement system. So instead of relying on Romanus and how he approached measuring animal behavior, he wanted a more scientific way to study comparative psychology. So uh, what was his premise? His premise was that most animal behavior is due to learning and it's based on some sensory experience, not a higher order uh, cognitive process, but a sensory experience. And that's big, right? Because when you want to say intelligence or infer intelligence in animals, you better be able to substantiate it and you better be able to prove that that's what's going on. Uh, and he argued that when you give animals human-like qualities and you cannot uh, substantiate that, that is anthropomorphism, right? And, and that's not okay. So I usually ask people at this point if they have pets. And the question I ask if um, a person has pets, how do you know your pet loves you, right? Because we always say, oh, my, my dog loves me. Oh, my cat loves me. How would you know your, let's say, anyone have a dog that wants to do this demo with me? Through affection. I have a dog. Say what? Through affection. Okay. Do you have a dog? Yeah, I have two dogs. Perfect. So I'm going to ask you, um, how does your dog show affection? When I get home, they bark really loud, run to the door, jump up and down on top of me, cry, give me kisses. Don't so, leave my side. When I go to, they follow me wherever I go. I you gave me them. a lot. And in order for me to demonstrate anthropomorphism, I got to do one at a time. Could it be that your dog is barking 
because of the sound that they hear, not because they love you? Maybe. It could, it could be, but I know that's not why. My dog only does it when I come home. He doesn't do what anybody okay. else Okay. You said your dog gives you kisses or licks you. Could it be that there's salinity or sweat that your dog is um, trying to taste because they like the taste of sweat? Absolutely. Could it be when your dog lays next to you and you rub their belly and they get so excited that it's not that they love you, it's just that they love free massages? Absolutely. Could it be that your dog is coming up to you because they want you to feed them, not because they love you? Now, look, Ro Rosemary, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to ruin your experience with your dog. But there are other alternative interpretations of why the dog is doing what they're doing. Has your dog ever said to you definitively, I love you? But you could say the same thing about a child. Well, it's how do you know your child loves you because they hug you? Are they hugging you just because they want attention? Is your you child just telling you they love you? A child. They want Hang on. You could say the same thing about a child until they can speak. And when they speak, they can actually tell you what they feel. A dog is never going to tell you what they feel. So your dog is always in the status of an infant that is you know, pre-verbal, um, never going to tell you I love you. So the fact that you think you're- Can a person just say also that a child is lying when they say I love you? You could, but what, what's motivating that lie? They want attention. They- It's possible. It's possible. Now you could see authentic love through- through other things and through time if it's a lie it's hard to keep up a lie now your dog is never going to confirm your feeling but you're going to hold on to that because it does something for you and what does it do for you it makes it feel good to take care of them it makes it feel like oh i'm appreciated so you feel love for the dog and you project that onto the dog, assuming they love you back because it's what facilitates you taking care of them. Now, all of this is a hypothesis because we won't know uh, about the, we won't know definitively whether any pet truly loves us they, they can't communicate but we certainly want to feel like they do and morgan would say you're engaging in anthropomorphism right so it's it's wild because what he basically constrains us against is trying to superimpose human quality professor in an animal yeah so what would you say about a nonverbal child so a nonverbal child can't use sign language? Language doesn't have to be. And, and what if they can use sign language? How are we supposed to know they love us? I got bad news for you. You may not know they love you. You may know that they're dependent on you, but you may not know if they're nonverbal cannot use sign language to express love the closest you can get is something called attachment we can study attachment through behavior but you won't know definitively that that child loves you maybe they'll write it i don't know if, if they can't speak sign or write you may not know a hundred percent And I'll ask you another question to make it even a little more uncomfortable. Um, 
the hugging and the kissing, Sarah, might be for their own benefit, that they feel gratification in the hugging and the kissing, right? We could argue the same thing that we did for the dog. And this is a good question by Rosa Maria. We won't know definitively, right? Um, and that, that's awkward. We don't, wanna, we don't wanna feel that, but it is possible. It is possible that in some cases we won't know. In any event, he really was by the book, did not want to superimpose any human-like qualities on uh, animals. And <laughs> he basically tried to do better experimental studies than comparative psychology. So he did large-scale studies, basic manipulations, keep in mind the time period, he still doesn't have the same level of environmental control. So even his conclusions are limited. But if we were to think of animal research, he does bring us closer. He brings us closer to science, which is not jumping to conclusions, only going where the data brings us. Now, uh, that is the lesson. Before I do a quick review, any questions? Okay. So I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>